on the State Library website. And just as an FYI, our monthly reports from the State Library are also posted on the State Library website. So we try to stay in touch with you as much as possible so that you always know what's going on here. So let's get started. <clears throat> the big news, of course, is the budget. And actually, it was kind of bad news for us this year because the state took a 2% reduction in state aid. State aid is such a huge chunk of the state library's budget that it really is the largest slice of the pie in the state library. And it's actually a very large slice of the pie in our Department of Cultural Resources, which is where the State Library resides. So it's an easy target, unfortunately. Um, the total state aid is 13207033, 13 million. That's down from a high of about 16, seven years ago, I believe. Um, one of the problems with the state aid cut this year, and this is um, money that's the state allocates to public libraries is that uh, the way the 2% cut was realized is that uh, the budget actually established a cap on two of our county libraries, and those are the public libraries in Mecklenburg and Wake counties. And with the cap of $400,000 on those two libraries, they, the, that equaled around a $284,000 cut. And so they are the only two libraries affected by this cut to state aid. This is unprecedented. It's never happened before. And we hope that it won't happen again because the cap was only in the current budget year. So while the 2% cut is a recurring cut, in future years, that 2% cut should be spread evenly not, not that state aid is evenly, but should be spread across all the public library systems in the state receiving state aid, um, unless some action is taken by the budget officer or the governor or who knows to um, keep the cap in place. I don't anticipate that happening, however. And I can say that there was some consternation among public library directors and of course, especially the directors in Mecklenburg and Wake County about this cap. And at the August meeting of public library directors, there was some discussion about um, sending some letters to the governor uh, objecting to the cap. Because it's basically what it works out to is a change in the state aid formula. Uh, also discussed at that meeting was how are we going to talk to our legislature and our legislators about this cut and indeed the future of libraries and the funding for libraries. The Public Library Directors Association has a legislative committee and they are sponsoring something called the Day in the District in 2015. This will be early next year, and it will be one week that the library directors will select where they invite local government officials to visit their local libraries. And these officials could be a county commissioner, city manager, somebody at the state level, some state legislator, or even the national level, a congressman or a senator. And the goal, as you can see, is to communicate what a modern library is it does, because we think that there's uh, a lack of understanding among some of our elected officials who don't use their local public library about what it is that they actually do and how important they are on the local level. So you may be hearing more about that um, next year, uh, but that's just one of the uh, activities that we're taking to try to protect state aid and public libraries around the state. Moving on to some good news, I'm going to tell you a little bit now about some of the activities in the Government and Heritage Library, which is the library portion of the state library. So we have a library with a collection and a staff, and they provide various services, not only to state employees, but also to others, other users around the state. One of the things they're working on that's pretty cool is a MOOC. We're co-creating a MOOC 
in conjunction with Wake Forest University about basic genealogy. We've done filming here in our genealogy collection of our genealogy librarians and uh, registration for this MOOC will open in January. So this will be something that you may want to make your patrons aware of, especially uh, your genealogy patrons. They're probably beyond basic genealogy, but it may be an opportunity for them to learn more about what resources are available in both the genealogy section here at the State Library and in the State Archives. In keeping with that theme, the State Library offers its Family History Fair. This will be the year that we're having that fair. And it's going to be, as you can see, on October 25th. There's a lot of people that come. We have over 20 vendors who come to the fair and set up displays. We have presentations. And this year, I just these presentations just slay me. We're having. Uh, Dr. A.B. Pruitt is going to be presenting grants in North Carolina before 1776. And then Stuart Dunaway is going to present Road, Bridge, and Ferry Records, a new path in genealogy research. Information about the Family History Fair is at the URL that Jeffrey just posted. And if you want to come or make this uh, put this on the radar of your genealogy patrons. They're welcome to come. People seem to love it. They come and tend to spend all day, believe it or not. Also of interest to that population is the North Carolina Digital Collections. We have a new interface. And I really like the look of it. And I think it's easier to browse and search the digital collections that are available from the State Library and the can see some of the separate collections that we have. The newest one is in the upper left-hand corner, and that's Confederate Pension Applications. Again, a resource that might be useful to your genealogy patrons. And Jeffrey has posted the URL, which he will continue to do. So whenever I mention a URL, he will post it in the chat so you can <clears throat> write it down or get it. OK, also another service or resource provided by the GHL is NCpedia. And that is the North Carolina Online Encyclopedia. And we have been adding content from the UNC Press. So we have just completed adding the North Carolina biography. And the last article that we added was about a man named Gaston Means, who apparently was a detective, scoundrel, and a swindler. So if you would like to know more about Mr. Means, go to NCPD and you can read all about him. We've also added the North Carolina Gazetteer. And we keep adding new content. So there's the URL. And I hope you go look at, uh, look at it. Sheila, thank you for helping us get the word out. Oh, 25th, 26th. Let's see. It is a Saturday, so it is the 25th. Sorry. OK, we'll pass, pass that on to um, the folks downstairs so they can make that correction. Thank you. Another type of library that the State Library hosts is the Library for Blind and Physically Handicapped. This library provides resources for people with physical or visual handicaps that make it hard for them to hold a book or to see a book. And they do programs. I just thought this was really cool. I did not know that October is Art Beyond Sight Awareness Month. And in honor of that month, the LBPH staff put on a program at the NC Museum of Art called Tactile Art. And 21 people attended the program and experienced art in a new way. My favorite comment from the tour was one participant who said that the tactile tour was the first time in his entire life 
that he had gotten a sense of what art really is. Pretty amazing. The Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped is available to any person in North Carolina. And if you become aware that any of your patrons have read all of your large print books or are starting to experience visual difficulties as a result of aging, you can refer them to our LBPH. Materials are mailed directly to pa patrons. They land right on their doorstep, and then the patrons mail them back. It's a really nice service, and the people who use it just love it. So we rely on libraries to help us get the word out about that wonderful program, and we hope you will help us do that too. Library Services and Technology Act, LSTA. As you know, the State Library offers grants every year using LSTA funds. And the grant awards for 2014-15 have just been announced. Now, why am I telling you that we have a complete list of grant awards on our website? Because it's not too early to begin planning for next year. And a great way to plan is to browse through the grants that were awarded this year. And you might get some ideas for projects that would be useful in your library next year. So I encourage you to go <clears throat> and do that. Um, hopping down to the bottom of this slide, you can see that for 15-16, the guidelines for next year's programs are now available. One of the new grant categories at 14-15 that we will continue in 15-16 is this innovation grant category. This is really cool. And it, if you're interested at all, I encourage you to go check out the innovation grants that were funded. This is anything that you think is innovative. It, it, we're looking for new stuff, but it can be stuff that's new or that you're <clears throat> tweaking in some way so it will be new in your library. Uh, not only are we providing innovation grants to libraries, but we are providing a, a little innovation grant money to the state library that we can use when a strategic opportunity comes along. And jumping back up to the first bullet, that opportunity came along pretty fast this year because we have already used that money for this Easy Edge technology program. The Edge project is for public libraries, and it is a way for them to take an assessment of their technology resources. And that includes everything surrounding technology, including personnel and equipment and programs to see how they stack up against other libraries or against themselves over time. And basically towards the benchmarks of what we're looking for in good technology programs. As a result of taking the assessment, public libraries get a action item list of where they need to do some work in order to improve their technology programs. So these grants are very small mini grants of up to $5,000 that public libraries can apply for to help them carry out some of the action items in their um, EDGE grant action plans. We've had quite a few applicants already, and we're very excited to be able to be so <clears throat> strategic um, with this innovation money that we have allowed ourselves. I think we'll do that again next year because it's working out well. Also for next year, now I'm jumping back down to the 15-16 program, and the guidelines are available now. So uh, the innovation grants are very similar to what they were last year. But if you looked at the application last year, you'll notice that this year's application is just slightly different. This is a new program, and we're learning as we go along and making changes. Also new are these planning grants. So right now, our planning grants for strategic planning and even facilities planning tend to be kind of large, multi-day, expensive projects. We realize that not everybody needs to do that kind of, or wants to do that level of planning. And so <clears throat> we're changing that category to allow for streamlined strategic planning. So it's going to be like easy 
strategic planning, perhaps not multiple day and not a whole lot of time and effort, but still ending up with a good plan that you can use to um, carry your library forward for the coming years. So watch for that, too. I'll be really interested to see how popular that is. I think it's something that we need. But we'll find out when we put it out there. Also in LSTA news, <clears throat> the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences is the federal organization that sponsors the LS LSTA programs. And every five years, they visit the state libraries that receive funding from IMLS. And we just had our visit, our program officer, James Lonergan, and an IMLS associate deputy director, Robin Dale, came to visit. And they had a great time. They came to the state library. And they also visited some funded projects around the state. So they went to Duke University uh, Divinity Library. They're, they're involved in some digitization. They went to the NC Digital Heritage Center at UNC, the Forsyth County Public Library in Winston-Salem to look at their homeless project, Charlotte's Atkins Library at UNC Charlotte, and the Charlotte Mecklenburg Library. Um, they liked our program and actually asked if they could use some of our documentation as examples for other states. So I give all the credit for that. We're delighted with our praise. We can't sit back and bask in it because IMLS legislation on the federal level is up for reauthorization in 2016. So Congress has to enable the um, funding of the IMLS program for it to continue. So of course, we're going to be spending a lot of time on advocacy in 2015. And the very best way to do that is to come up with really robust methods to prove the, the efficacy of this funding in the state of North Carolina. When we evaluate our projects, when we pull together data about what this funding actually does, that is, gives IMLS the ammunition they need to take to Capitol Hill and defend this funding that's so very important for all of us. So, We'll be continuing to evaluate our LSTA projects throughout the year and in the future. NC Cardinal is an LSTA funded project. It's one of our statewide projects, and it is maturing. Cardinal is the shared ILS among public libraries in North Carolina, and we now have 18 library systems that belong. It is also growing up in terms of the governance structure for Cardinal. So it is slowly transitioning off the state library and onto the members of the Cardinal Consortium themselves. So we have a new memorandum of agreement in bylaws and um, cost sharing. So libraries, while it's free to them the first two years, their members, then they start picking up some of the costs themselves. And that has started in this last fiscal year. We've shortened the application period. We're trying to get the application period to be more in line with local budget calendars for counties and cities in the state. So uh, we'd, love, we'd like to get feedback on that. If you are considering joining or applying and have some feedback about this application period, let us know, because that's new. We do have five library systems lined up to come on to Cardinal in this last year. And um, that's Rockingham, Harnett, Northwestern Regional, Brown Library, and Bladen. And as kind of a little shocking development, Albemarle Regional Library withdrew. That's something that we really had never anticipated. So it was a good thing because we had to accommodate that in our paperwork, in the memorandum of agreement and the bylaws. And we have now done that. So in the future, if another library wants to withdraw, we have the procedures all ready to go. 
Other cardinal news, we've hired two new support staff. So Tanya Prokrim is the consultant who manages the cardinal program. And she has two help, support helpers. Johnny Pippen took the place of um, David Green, who was here. And he helps with the help desk and uh, is a cardinal consultant. And then we've just created a brand new third cardinal support position. And that has been filled by April Durrance. And she and Johnny jumped right in and um, are hard at work. Three migrations are in process. I think Johnny's very first day on the job, he was out at one of these libraries um, talking about their migration. We have also, in the last, uh, this month, earlier this month, the State Library of North Carolina hosted the Southeast Regional Evergreen Conference. This conference hosted 125 attendees from three states including uh, not just North Carolina, but Georgia and Virginia as well. And it was an opportunity for Cardinal users to talk to each other. And from what I hear, Tanya says the evaluations are very positive. And in fact, people are saying, hey, are you going to do this again next year? I can't guarantee that, but we definitely will look into that. And perhaps Georgia or Virginia will step up and take take on the hosting duties. Uh, continuing education. Let me just tell you, there is a lot going on in continuing education. And if you're on any of our listservs from the State Library, you received an email yesterday about <clears throat> all of the training that's coming up. Some of this is due to the change in the NC Live resources that are going to be the new resources and platforms will be coming into use on January 1 of next year. So we've got to do a lot of training this fall to get people ready for that. We also have other workshops that are available. We've got, um, I know we've got a management one or a super, supervisor one. There it is, that second bullet. And the, the interesting thing about that is we're co-sponsoring it with LAMS of the NCLA. Um, of the North Carolina Library Association. Uh, we've got Tackling RDA. And I was looking at the registration on those this morning, and they're already filling up. So there's obviously a lot of interest in those. What I'm going to say is that I cannot do justice in this webinar to all of the multiple workshops and trainings that are coming up. So I really encourage you to go to the train station uh, the URL is right there. And check it out. There is so much content on the train station. So many workshops that are sponsored by not just the State Library, but others as well. And so whatever it, your training needs are, you should be able to find something to meet them. <clears throat> if you have any questions about any of these programs, Kelly Brannick is our consultant for continuing education. And I know she'd be happy to talk to you. I also know she's kind of busy these days getting these all set up. So <clears throat> try, see if you can figure it out on train station first. We have other kinds of training that we're offering, too. In fact, we have two new online training hosts, I guess you could say, or two different ways of offering online training. And the first one is the skill port training portal. You can see there's a lot of courses there. They have many short courses, which sometimes it's hard to find an hour in your day or even a half hour in your day to sit down to take a course. Or maybe you're even doing this at the desk. Five minutes is a lot more uh, suitable in terms of fitting that into a busy day. So any staff member working in North Carolina can, libraries can create an account. And there is the URL for doing that. And Kelly's putting in a plug for her CE info listserv. That is the very best way to stay abreast of what continuing education is coming out. And she doesn't spam you either. It's not an overwhelming number of messages. Uh, our other online portal for training is called lynda.com. 
and uh, you can see that it covers the topics that it covers. That is not available just yet. I went and checked this page yesterday, so <clears throat> it's coming soon. We're just waiting to get some of the paperwork processed, I hear, and then that will be available for you, too. We'd love to get feedback on either of these providers. <clears throat> so if you, any of you take a course or have a request for something that isn't covered by these two, we're always happy to hear from you and happy to get feedback on what we're offering because we're always looking for ways to do it better. So feel free to get, contact any one of us at any time and give us your feedback. I saw that Joyce was here. <clears throat> I don't know if she still is. Oh, there she is. Hey, Joyce. Joyce Chapman retired. And so that's why we're seeking, at the bottom of this slide, a consultant for communication and data analysis. And if you'd like to know more about it, you can private message Joyce and find out what it's all about. That We've just advertised that job, so it is open right now. Uh, that was a sad day when Joyce left, but we're also going to have some other uh, retirements coming up. Larise Hyman has been our sort of office manager for well over 20 years. A lot of people know Larise. She's a very snappy dresser, and we're really going to miss her and her lovely outfits around the office. Also retiring is Debbie King who is in our administrative uh, unit. And they're both retiring near the end of this year. So we're going to be bereft without them for a little while. And then again, I've already addressed the cardinal support. The exciting thing about that is that we've actually added that third position. So we're hoping that support will be um, faster and will be more responsive to all the requests that come in. Um, with Joyce's departure, Jennifer wanted me to let you, Jennifer Pratt wanted me to let you know that the liaisons of the public library consultants, the libraries that they work with have been changed once again. So if you locate your library on, the, your public library on this map, you can see which of the state library consultants will be coming out to give you a visit any day now because consultants are getting ready to start their site visits. It's a little hard to see, but the blue counties are Molly Westmoreland, our consultant for administration. Green counties are Jeffrey Hamilton, who is on this, supporting this webinar today. Yellow counties, Kelly Brannick, continuing education. Purple is Laurie Special, our youth services consultant, and orange is Jennifer Pratt, and she is the chief of library development. Another thing that Molly Westmoreland does is she manages the North Carolina Center for the Book. Uh, the Center for the Book always sponsors Let's Talk About It series, and those are scholar-led reading and discussion programs for adults that public libraries can sign up for and host in their libraries. Uh, we work with the NC Humanities Council and they line up a scholar to come and actually speak at these programs. So it's a great way to um, have an adult program in your library. With, we send you the books that the, that the people read, and the Humanities Council provides the scholars. So it's a pretty easy program for libraries to sponsor. If you'd like to know more, check our website or talk to Molly. Molly has also just initiated a new listserv for library staff serving adults. And while it's a place where you can share programming ideas for adults, you can also mention any other aspect of your work. So if you have a question, if you have an idea to share, this is the place to do it. There are over 250 subscribers already, so you've got a lot of advisors right there on that list if you do have a question. One of our biggest programs that the State Library sponsors is the Summer Reading Program for Children and Teens. And here are our statistics for this year. So how does this compare to future years? 
Well, the number of participants is down slightly. The number of programs offered is steady. And the number of books checked out is down slightly. The biggest change this past year is that for the first time, we asked readers during the summer reading program to report the minutes that they read, not the number of books that they read. And I asked Laurie Special to tell me why, why minutes over number of books. And what she said is that counting minutes really sort of levels the playing field. If you're reading 20 minutes, you may be reading a page or two. If you're a struggling reader, well, hopefully more than that. Or you may be whipping through books if you're a more um, a better reader, somebody that has greater reading skills. So we want them to understand that reading is enjoyable no matter how many pages you read. So we want you to read, we want those children to read whatever they want. And I mean, I, as a former children's librarian, I've seen high schoolers coming in and checking out those easy books just to rack up the number of books that they read. So we think that this is a better way to reinforce the habit of reading and to encourage children to read what they want that's of interest to them and not just trying to rack up books. So this year was our base year for minutes and 36 million minutes. I worked out the other day what that worked out to in time and it's over a year. It's multiple years. So it's a, it's a very um, impressive statistic and one that we'll be able to compare ourselves against next summer um, and see if children have read more minutes or not. And that, this is a new world record because that concludes my presentation. So I wanted to see, this is a time for you to ask questions of me or Jeffrey or each other. So let me know if you have any questions. I don't see anybody type. Oh, Becky's typing. OK. We're talking about that right now, Becky. Um, as you know, the consultants, when they make their site visits, they have a core set of questions. And Jennifer asked me just the other day if I had something that I wanted to add. I haven't seen the core question, so I haven't responded to her yet. But if you or anybody else has a topic that you would like to suggest, I'd love to hear it. Because this is a, uh, a great way to get information from all um, 80, 84 library systems in the state because we visit every single one. And um, and Jane, I'm glad you I'm glad you think these are good to get. Um, I'm always happy to do them. It's a great way to just hit the high spots. And I'm hoping if people have questions that respond. I don't know if y'all are hearing my email when it pops in. Thanks for coming, Debbie. OK, I, oh, Amory's typing, OK. Yes, if you, if, if you don't have a question, feel free to go ahead and log out. And thanks for coming. I do these every two months. So the next one will be in December. And of course, we'll be advertising it on the train station. Thanks, Amory.